So in the second hour, I'm going to introduce you to the gory detail of how you actually calculate the absorption coefficient for OH. So that's really where we're headed. In order to do that, in the first hour, I'm going to introduce you to the, what happens when you add electrons into the problem in terms of our line positions. Remember, it's all about line positions, line strengths, and, and line shapes. Line shapes are actually pretty simple to deal with. Now what's happening is that quantum mechanics, angular momentum is everything. So when we bring electrons into the problem, not just the nuclei we've had so far, we have to worry about the angular momentum of the electron motions and of which there are two types, the spin of the electrons and the orbital angular momentum of the electron around the internuclear axis. Those two types of angular momentum have to be quantized. That causes uh, our specification for the energy levels and the splittings that take place. So it's a bit dense, this lecture, and the next one. But then by the third lecture, we'll be halfway through the course, and we'll be starting to talk about applications, and things will get a lot lighter. Hopefully, it will, motiv hopefully it will motivate you. So uh, diatomic molecules are, of course, the simplest molecules we can deal with. They're, they're, they're important in combustion. In many ways, what we're trying to do is help you understand where this diagram or diagrams like this come from. This is a plot of the wavelengths or the positions of the lines for the P, Q, and R branch of a diatomic molecule of a certain type. We're going to learn what this means up here. Uh, spectroscopy is like learning another language. Everything's compact definitions that you have to kind of master. And this, and in, buried inside this uh, term symbol is all the information that spectroscopists need to think about things. So this is the so-called four-trap parabola, which allows us to plot the positions of the lines in a given band within a given system. The electronic symbols tell us this is the system. And so you'll see that there is a, a, a band head here at high wave numbers. That means in the R branch. And uh, if you define M as minus J or J or J plus 1, you can plot all the line positions on this axis here with M and, and, and wave, wave number. Typically, we break these problems down into classifications. So I'm going to tell you about the common molecular models that we use. Remember, models are models. They're not exactly reality. They're ways of expressing understanding of, of, of a system. And we'll talk a little bit about how we improve on those as we move towards how do you actually do quantitative absorption. So the term symbol is what the spectroscopists use to to characterize the energy levels that are at play. For an atom, there's a symbolism that looks like this, in which there's a superscript, a subscript, and a primary letter. And these, letter, these, these uh, elements have meaning. For diatomic, it'll be rather similar. So instead of L, we have lambda. Uh, we have the same 2s plus 1 here. And these have to do with how we're characterizing the spin and the angular momentum of the electron. So that's what's happening. We're adding spin and angular momentum of the electron, and we have to honor the rules of quantum mechanics. Lambda uh, is, a, is a vector, but we only care about the, uh, the magnitude of this, which is the projection of the angular momentum of the electron. So you imagine the internuclear axis of the molecule is the figure axis, the unique axis, the A axis. Imagine the electrons are kind of swarming around that axis with orbital angular momentum. What counts is the component of that vector along the axis. The other parts don't count. And so and it can take on certain values. It can be 0, 1, 2. And just like we have um, um, OPQRS, we have uh, sigma pi delta. So when it's 0, we call this a sigma. And when lambda is 1, we call it a pi. Is the delta, and most of the time we're in, in with these two here. For atoms, it's very analogous. Although I'm not going to talk much about atoms. If L is the is the uh, uh, orbital component of the electron about the atom, we'll use L instead of lambda, but it's now SPD. So sigma pi delta SPD. You can see the analogy. So we have a symbolism that tells us the value of lambda up here. S is the total angular electronic spin. So that's the spin about its own little axis. It's another vector, but we usually only care about the 
the magnitude in, in uh, usually in certain directions. S is in half integer value, so each electron has a spin of a half. But we may have more than one spin to worry about. Turns out that it's mostly the projection of S onto the axis again that counts. And so it's a vector, but we care about the projection. And that's written in terms of the sigma here, units of h bar. So h bar, h bar is h over 2 pi are the units of this angular momentum. And there we have a loud value. So sigma, the value of sigma, could take on uh, s all the way down to minus s, or 2s plus 1 value. So it, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's the component along the axis, but it can take on only discrete values. So quantum mechanics will restrict us to certain orientations that result in these uh, values. Now, if you have two components along the axis, namely if you have uh, lambda and if you have sigma, what counts is the combination. So the sum of the projections of these two components along the axis is called omega. So there we are up here. So the orbital angular momentum, we have the spin up here. Now we just have 2s plus 1. That's called the multiplicity. And then the combination of the two down here in omega. And so those are the things we have to know about in order to calculate the positions of the lines. So let's look at some examples to make it easier. The electronic ground state of nitric oxide is called x2 pi. Here's our, here's our notation again, x2 pi. The x is there because it's a reminder that we're in the lowest electronic state. If it were the first excited state of the same multiplicity, it would be a capital A. So x is telling us which state we're talking about, and then the 2 pi is telling us that the spin is a half, so that 2, 2s plus 1 is 2. So there's a spin of a half. That means there's just one electron that we have to think about. Lam pi tells us that lambda is 1. And then omega, the combination, can be 1 plus a half. And then 1 minus a half can take on two positive values. Omega is, is always a positive number. We call this spin splitting. So basically, it's the two combinations of these quantities uh, that can, occur, can occur. So their spin is a half, lambda is 1, and then this lower quantum number here, omega, is either 1 half or 3 halves. And those two states have different electronic energy by 121 wave numbers. So in other words, we've, what we've done is we've just accounted for the fact that the electron spin and angular momentum can combine in two different ways. They have slightly different energy. We have to keep track of the energies in order to calculate the line positions. Carbon monoxide is another diatomic molecule. Its ground state is x1 sigma plus. Don't worry about the plus yet. The one tells us that the spin is zero. The, lambda, the sigma tells us that the lambda is zero. Therefore, there's no omega. And there's actually no contribution of electronic spin or angular momentum. And so this molecule acts as if we can ignore the electron contributions. This is called a rigid rotor molecule. Back to the same rigid rotor molecule we had before. This is the easiest case to deal with. Oxygen. The, molecular, the ground state of molecular oxygen is an X3 sigma G minus. Don't worry about those right now. So that tells me that's the ground state. This tells me that the spin is 1. This tells me that lambda is 0. So once I know these things, I know what relationships to use to specify the line positions, well, the energy levels. This is really all about energy levels. The vibrational energy levels are easy to characterize. The electronic states are determined by whichever one of these that we've got. Uh, and this is really mostly about what I'll call the rotational line positions. This particular example of this combination of uh, non-zero and zero is called a Hund's case B. So Hund is somebody who presented several models, approximations to reality, and uh, divided up by how lambda and S uh, their values of lambda and s. This would happen to be what's called Hunt's case B. I'll say more about this a little bit later. So the most common molecular models, meaning the most common situations for lambda and s, are that they're both 0. That's the rigid rotor one I just told you about. Or that lambda is unequal to 0, but s is 0. That's called a, you're going to find out that's exactly the same as the symmetric top that we've talked about. 
And when 2s plus 1 is, is uh, 1, as it is here, they're called singlets, meaning there's just one state, one uh, spin orbit state. Hunt's case A is when they're both non-zero, and Hunt's case B, the one I just showed you, is when lambda is zero and s is n equals zero. So basically, you look at the, uh, you look at the uh, term symbol of the molecule you're interested in, and you decide which of these categories does it fit into for that, for that energy, that electronic energy level. So then now here, the spin is important because the spin interacts with lambda. So when the electrons are orbiting around this internuclear axis, it's like there's a magnetic field along the axis of that molecule. And that means that that uh, magnetic field will interact with the spin and, and, and cause it to take on different energy levels. So the, the spin and the orbital angular momentum interact, and that impacts the specification of the energy level. So we're going to start with the rigid rotor symmetric top and work our way down through this case. So we're back to the rigid rotor. So if we have a one sigma molecule, there's no electron in this picture. That is, there's no spin contribution. So we define the A axis as always, the unique axis. We find the center of mass. We establish the B and the C axes. Moment of inertia about I A is, is not is nearly zero. IB equals IC, and we have exactly the same. We've already done this one. We did it when we did the, uh, the rigid rotor harmonic oscillator. But now we're talking about the electronic characteristics. So what that means is that for a molecule like this, the rotational energy states are already the ones you know about. The transition we're going to have is between one of those electronic uh, rotational states and the corresponding ones in the excited electronic state. So in this case, lambda zero, S is zero, one sigma, sigma omega is not defined. This is the, this is the easy case, <coughs> really quite simple. In this case, the rotational energy, this is all about rotational energy now. Rotational energy is still F of J, it's the rigid rotor term with the correction for the vibrational dependence and the distortion term, which you often can neglect. Total energy then of this of the in total internal energy of this molecule in this electronic state is the electronic energy. T sub B is the energy of the electronic state, which would be zero for the X state. Electronic energy uh, level, vibrational energy, rotational energy, and the energy change will be whatever delta E de we get from a delta T, delta G, delta F. If we're doing pure rotational transitions, we only have this number. If we're doing rho vibrational, we have this combination. If we're doing a, an electronic transition, we have to take into account all three. So what we're doing is we're adding in electrons, which means we're, this is how we deal with the different uh, term energies of the electronic states in question. So this, <clears throat> now we go to quantum mechanics again. The selection rules remain the same. Delta J is 1. Uh, rho vibrational, delta V is 1. And delta J is plus or minus 1. Ah, now rho vibronic. What are the selection rules for V for an electronic transition? Now we have, we have to resort to something called the Frank Condon factor, and that has to do with the, my argument that I told you that the time to change electronic orbit is small, so the transitions occur like vertical lines on our uh, energy level diagram. So therefore, the delta Vs that occur are, are determined by the alignment of these wells, and that's called the Frank Condon factors. So in rho vibronic spectra, when you have combined rotation, vibration, <coughs> electronic, we retain delta J of plus or minus one, but delta V is now going to depend upon these Frank Condon factors that are tabulated, specific to that molecule. Just a, a warning that sometimes in some books they define these, these uh, selection rules with different notation. They'll do final minus initial. I always do upper minus lower. It's just, it's just cleaner. So for rigid rotor, you might say, we're beginning to understand the relationship for the, for the energy levels. What will we see in the way of an intensity distribution for absorption or emission? First order, it always follows the population density and the rotational states. So within a given band, which means specified upper and lower vibrational quantum numbers for this electronic transition, intensity distribution is essentially the Boltzmann distribution modified slightly, and, and this is expressed by what's called the Honnold-London factor. So the Honnold-London factor is, is going to give us the 
the relative strength within the rotational distribution. Select that, it's an approximation, a big approximation. So the relative intensities between the different vibrational bands, meaning different combinations, is given by these Frank Condon factors. So now the total emission from any initial state, let's imagine we're doing emission from an excited state, a given initial uh, vibrational level. It's going to really depend upon the Boltzmann distribution within that level modified by this Frank Condon factor. So you'll begin to see this when we go through the example in the second hour. So we're doing diatomics. Fortunately, most stable diatomics, CO, chlorine, bromine, nitrogen, are rigid rotors. That's good, because they're the simplest ones. But there's some important, some important exceptions. NO is an X2 pi, that's the ground state again. Oxygen is the X3 sigma. And if I put down OH, it's also, an, uh, that's, I said stable, that's why I didn't list OH. But if I listed OH, another important diatomic but radical species, it's also an X2 pi. Turns out that no one has found any X delta states yet. So, so far, as far as I know, all ground states are either of this type, rigid rotors, are either sigma or pi. You might begin to ask, well, what happens when we go to a polyatomic like CO2? Well, I'm just going to tease you a little bit by saying, well, we still use X for the ground state, but now you see a tilde on top. It still looks about the same, but you, it has slightly different meanings when we go from diatomic to polyatomic. Somebody said something about nuclear spin. We don't deal with nu nuclear spin, which has to do with this another type of angular momentum, which is the spin of the nuclei, not the orbital angular momentum of the nuclei about the center of mass, but the spin of the nuclei. Well, every time something like that happens, you, you have angular momentum and you have to think about it. And then it's all sorted out by looking at the statistics, the quantum statistics. But fortunately, nuclear spin is only a factor when it's symmetric. So if, you, if you're lucky enough that it's a, um, a rigid rotor and it's heteronuclear, you don't have to think about nuclear spin. If it is symmetric, you've got to deal with nuclear spin, which is at least one more lecture I'm not going to give you. But um, it's in my book if you're interested. It's a, it's a, it's a, it be, what does it do? It perturbs the relative populations in the rotational states. That's what it does. So you would have heard of ortho and pair hydrogen. It explains that. So you just first ask, is it, is it uh, symmetric? No, asymmetric. If it's symmetric, you've got to deal with nuclear spin. If it's asymmetric, so we've got NO, I'm going to do OH as my example in the next hour. NO, OH, CO, you don't have to think about nuclear spin. It's like a constant multiplier. It's not really that complicated, but it's complicated to understand, but the result is not that complicated to deal with. Next level of complexity is called the symmetric top. So now we still have the two nuclei. We've got the figure axis. And now what's happening in the symmetric top, we have lambda is then equal to zero. What does that mean? That's the, it's the component of angular momentum due to the orbital motion of the electrons along this axis. Now, when we have that, and we always reserve J for the total angular momentum, we have to introduce a new notation for the angular momentum of the nuclei about the center of mass, which we previously called J, we now call N. So N is the quantum number that characterizes the uh, angular momentum about the B axis, this is the B axis here, of just the nuclei, the mass of the nuclei. That's what we use. So in the rigid rotor model, that we use J. But when you go to the symmetric top, because we've got a new quantum number, we redefine the angular momentum of the nuclei and we call it N. That would be along this direction here. Now we have a vector combination of this angular momentum and this angular momentum, which combines to give us J. J is, again, reserved for the total angular momentum. So this is the uh, combination. So now you can have, in this situation here, uh, because lambda is unequal to zero, we can have, there's no, uh, there's no sigma. It can be a pi or a delta, although I just told you we've never found a delta. So that's like saying that in all these cases, they're going to be pi's. If, if lambda is not equal to zero, the only one we've been able to find is when lambda is one, so a pi. So spin is zero, so we get a one. 
lambda in this case we found is always limited to, it's not zero, but we're gonna say it can only be one, is one pi. So N is the angular momentum of the nuclei about the, about the B axis. Um, J is always the total, which is a vector combination. And uh, this lambda is just the projection. So we only care, they call that being a good quantum number. We only care about the component in certain directions. Okay. So only the axial component of this orbital angular momentum is used. And this is my compact description because only lambda is the so-called good quantum number. So you'll hear these words, a good quantum number. Okay, so we're at the symmetric top with these properties, and that was the rotational energy. <coughs> rotational energy is the quantity that we're used to. Here's the rigid. There's the uh, component we're used to, plus this. Doesn't this look exactly like what we did with the symmetric top for rho vibrational? It is exactly the same thing. So it is a symmetric top. It has the same properties of the symmetric top we talked about for rotational motion. So there's no surprise that we get an A minus B lambda squared. So J has to be lambda or bigger. If lambda is one, then the minimum value of J is one. Because J is the total. So this is the expression which, if you look at it, is exactly the same as the one we had for the symmetric top for the rotational uh, polyatomic molecules. It has the same meaning. But there are times when it takes on a strange behavior. I'll talk about that in a little bit. This is the same expression I think was in lecture four. Now, the moment of inertia about A, the moment of inertia about A is a very small number. Uh, it, the moment of inertia of B is much bigger, and that tells you that the value of A is much greater than B. And so, and the other point being that the lines, J has to be lambda or bigger. Okay. What about the selection rule? So remember, we have we have uh, expressions for the energies of the levels, and then we have to have selection rules. Selection rules that uh, lambda can either remain unchanged, in which case delta J is plus or minus one with a very weak possibility for delta J of zero, so basically P and R, or lambda can change by either plus or minus one, in which case you can have a Q branch also. So in this case, it's mostly P and R, very, very weak Q branch. In this case, you can have P, Q, and R. So when lambda changes, you pick up a Q branch. As a result of having a Q branch, the bands will be double-headed, and that's on the diagram that I showed you at the beginning. Okay. So in contrast, so when you have only P and R, you usually you can only have one band head. But in the case of the when you have Q branch, you can have two. All right. So the symmetric top. And we would look at the spectra for the case, let's look first at the case when, when lambda does not change. In other words, from a one pi to a one pi. So you have to specify the term symbol for the lower state and for the upper state. So we, in each of those, we have a lambda. If delta lambda is zero, such as this one, I list this possibility, except we've never found a one delta. Then the upper state term energy, capital T, is the rotational contribution, now the rotational contribution, allowing for the fact it's a symmetric top, plus the vibrational contribution, plus the electronic energy. Now we do this for the lower state, same thing. If the lower state is the ground state, then this term is zero. So basically, the big energy difference is this, is this difference right here. So that's zero for the ground state. Now, recognize that if we're only gonna look at the lines within a given band, within a given band, then uh, uh, these would be constants. And we mostly are playing around with the possible values that come about from changes in J and, and lambda. Okay, so you could then, in this case, derive expressions for the P line positions as this new infinity. So we've defined new infinity here to be the difference between the upper state and the lower state for J of zero, just to pick a, a specific value. That basically, it means these terms right here. And you can do the same thing for the Q branch. Because when you do that, you notice that some of these 
combinations that have a minus sign. So where you're going to get the band head depends upon the relative size of these things. It's either going to be in the P or the R, depending on the, uh, the sign of this term here. And if we, if we use the substitution to define uh, M in the P branch as minus J, M in the Q branch of J, M in the R branch is J plus 1, you can rewrite these expressions in this way so that the positions of the lines in a given band in a given electronic transition is a constant plus AM plus BM squared where A is the sum and B is the difference. So that way, by writing it this way, we have one expression for, for, for P and R and, and then our expression here for uh, You take that into account, you now can plot the same diagram that I had on slide one. So this is a case where we have these simple expressions, and now you have to decide what is the sign of this term here. In this case, you have a band head here, and you have another band head here. It's buried under it within this band, but there will be a sharp edge here and a sharp edge here. There's always a minimum value of j that depends upon the values of lambda. So if we had a 1 delta, I told you we've never found one. If we had a 1 delta, the j minimum would be 2, because lambda is, is 2. Or uh, lambda is typically 1 here. So that would mean that the minimum value of j is, would be 1. But in the case I plotted, the minimum value of j is 2. And so if you look across, that's the first line in the Q branch. So the minimum value will turn out to be 2 in the Q branch and 3 in the, in the P and the R. And there's missing lines. So there's, there's a bunch of missing lines in here. That if you had some spectra, you act, we could fit it to these parabolic shapes, and you could do a better job of fitting line positions. OK, what about the and, okay, spectroscopy is position, strength, and lines. So what about the intensity of the lines? It basically depends upon the fractional population in a given rotational state. If we stay within one band with specified B prime and B double prime and just look at the relative intensities of all these lines, it basically follows the Boltzmann distribution over J expressed in what's called the Honolunden factor. You'll see how that's done. Uh, that, uh, in that, if I neglect the Honolunden factor, then I would say that all lines, that the spectrum follows exactly the Boltzmann distribution. It doesn't, it's not exactly the Boltzmann distribution, so it's typical to use these factors that you'll see. Here they are. These are the Hunnell-London factors for a symmetric top taken out of the book, Hertzberg. Hertzberg has at least three volumes, volume one and two, one, two, and three. This would be volume one. So in the case, where, remember, I said delta lambda can be zero or plus or minus one. In the case where delta lambda is zero, the expressions for the, the uh, Hunnell-London factors are shown here. It looks kind of complicated, but when you realize that lambda is, is uh, say, 1, this is basically just uh, j plus 1. j, remember, lambda is small, j can be big. Similarly, this one is approximately 0. It's weak because lambda is smaller than typically j, and so on. Now, if you add them all up, you get 2j plus 1. So everything is normalized. Everything is normalized so that the sums come out easily. So the sum of these Honolunden factors is 2j plus 1. And that's called the total degeneracy. Next thing to note is that the R branch up here is not exactly equal to the P branch. It's larger by the ratio j plus 1 over j. So I always tell the students, think first that it follows the Boltzmann distribution. But then what you realize is that R branch is always slightly higher by this ratio, j plus 1 over j. So that's the, an improvement. Now, if delta lambda is plus or minus 1 instead of 0, you get some modified expressions. They're not quite the same, but you look them up. Now what you find is that the Q branch is strong, and in fact, it's twice as strong as either the P or the R. So when delta lambda is 0, the Q branch is really weak. When delta lambda is 1, the Q branch is twice as strong as the P or the R. So if you're intentionally looking to make a measurement, you would want to use the Q branch. So let's see what happened. 
quantum mechanics is giving us rules. If we just accept them, we can write these things down and find out why are some bands stronger than others. OK, here's an example uh, for symmetric ground states. So remember I said uh, about the, the only ones we've ever seen are 1 pi. So if we have a 1 pi going to 1 pi, that's called a delta lambda of 0. 1 pi goes to 1 delta, it's plus 1. 1 pi could go to a 1 sigma. In that case, delta lambda is minus 1. So those are the three possibilities for this symmetric top molecule. What does that mean? That means if you're in a ground state and it's x1 pi, you actually can have three systems of bands. If you go from x1 pi to either 1 pi or 1 delta or 1 delta, you get different groups of lines. These are different electronic transitions because of the different spin orbit coupling. It just means that the lines appear different places in the spectrum. But once I have the term symbols, once I know the two states involved, I know the rules. I can use those to interpret the strengths of the lines. All right. So I'm telling you about the role of the electrons in producing elect angular momentum of two types, orbital and spin. It all has to do with how they interact. They interact in ways that changes the energy level structure. Now, the next cases, we've done rigid rotor, symmetric top. The next cases are Hunt's case A and Hunt's case B. Here's Hunt's case A. Hunt's case A means that both of these things are non-zero. So now we have the component here of lambda, that's the orbital angular momentum, and we have the component of the spin, so we have a sigma. It looks really a lot like um, the, the case we just had of the top. So we add these things up. We use n the same way. J is the total. And you can expect very similar uh, equations that we had before, except that we now have um, values of omega that combine uh, these two contributions. Hunt's case B, this is a funny one. This is, uh, but it's relevant because we have molecules like uh, oxygen. Hunt's case B, lambda is 0, but S is not. Now, because lambda is 0, meaning there's no net orbital angular momentum of the electrons about this axis. There's no magnetic field to lock down s, in which case we define only sigma. So now s is just a vector. And it now is vector combined with n to give us j. So j is still the total. n and s are still relevant, except here we have to use s instead of sigma. Now, we'll find that there's one more complexity called lambda doubling. So you have to imagine, well, what if lambda is pointing the other way? What if the orbital angular momentum is, is reverse, was clockwise versus counterclockwise? Well, that means that, the, that lambda and sigma uh, interact slightly differently. And every state that we had before is now doubled. There's two combinations, depending, depending on the, the orientation of, of lambda. That's the way to think about it. It's called lambda doubling. OK, so let's kind of review what's happening. We've introduced term symbols as the compact notation for keeping track of how the electrons are coming into play. We had the superscript we call the multiplicity, which will, turns out to be basically a number of, uh, of states that are involved in this uh, combination. We have the projection of the electronic angular momentum of an orbital type on the a-axis. And we have the sum of the projections when lambda is not 0. If lambda is equal to 0, we have to go to Hunt's case b. So here's our symbolism. Here's our vector uh, combination. And here's the uh, uh, combination of these terms along the axis. OK, so that's the, kind of the overview. And we have these four models, rigid rotor, symmetric top, Hunt's case a, Hunt's case b. When we add spin, we have to do these two here. And here's some examples. So nitrogen, hydrogen are there, the X1 sigma type. That's nice. Only complexity here is that we have to worry about nuclear, nuclear spin. Metric top, 1 pi is the only one we found. Um, in the, in the uh, in Hunt's case A, of which there are two important examples, OH and NH, they're both X2 pi's. Oxygen is X3 sigma. So a lot of the molecules we care about in combustion are taken care of by this grouping. 
I want to understand um, now how we deal with um, a little more detail of the angular momentum of these electrons. So we have orbital angular momentum and we have spin angular momentum. So this is now separate from the nuclear rotation that we think about with rigid rotor and it's separate now from the spin. So how do you think about this? So these are electrons that are swarming around producing some sort of vector, a vector amount of orbital angular momentum, although we only care about the component along here. That component can take on different values. We call that component uh, uh, lambda, and it can take on different values of, uh, of the vector L. If we reverse the direction, that's what I was just telling you about. You can imagine going clockwise or counterclockwise, then it's got to go the other direction. And that change impacts the, the coupling with the spin to give us slightly separated energy levels, and we call that lambda doubling. And you'll, and you'll see what that does to us pretty soon. For the spin of the electrons, uh, we typically add up the spins. If there's an even number, that means we're going to get an integral because each individual electron has a spin of a half. If there's an odd number of electrons, it's always half integral, half, half integral. As I was explaining earlier, when you have orbital angular momentum, uh, you have to imagine that that L is just kind of uh, uh, precessing around the internuclear axis, producing a magnetic field. There is an effective magnetic field, and that causes the uh, spin to be locked to the axis and taking on only these allowed numbers. So spin now can be, let's say spin's a half. Spin can be, can be one half or minus one half. It's all orientational. So all this has to do with keeping track of orbital angular momentum, how it couples between two types, and how that impacts the energy levels. And we eventually just have equations that describe this for us. When lambda is zero, there's no magnetic field, and that's why sigma is not defined. So we're going to continue on this idea of trying to help you understand why these energy differences occur. Total angular momentum of the electrons along the axis is the combination of lambda and sigma. This is another argument that tries to explain the splitting. So when lambda is unequal to zero, it produces a magnetic field along the axis of the molecule. When there's a magnetic moment, that magnetic moment, which is usually written as a mu, interacts with the spin. So it's basically impacting the spinning electron in a way that's expressed by this magnetic moment. That's the terminology from electromagnetic theory. So the interaction energy is proportional to mu times the strength of the magnetic field. Therefore, that combination, these are the quantum numbers, the combination. So what this is, this is a simple argument that says the electronic energy would be some base number plus product of lambda and, and sigma times a constant A. We don't know what that constant is yet. Usually A is a positive number, in which case the, the um, and here's the states that I might have. I might have 2 pi 1 half, or I might have 2 pi 3 halves. This is now where I have lambda is 1, 1 plus a half. This is where it's 1 minus a half, meaning that the spin's gone the other way. Usually the 3 half is higher. But there are cases that are called inverted, which corresponds to A being negative, in which case the omega 3 halves is lower. So those are two examples. They can, you can have either regular or inverted. So that's just telling you this is a constant, but it can be either plus or minus. OK, so I've already, we've talked before about the, uh, the nuclear rotation. That's just a rigid rotor idea that the moment of inertia is about the b-axis, but we now call it n when there's the other contributions to j. Spin orbit coupling. So all of this, all of these things would be called spin orbit coupling. Here we have models, but models are approximations to reality. And the model may break down as you change from low j to high j. So when it's rotating kind of, when j is small, it might be a little different than when J is big. And we run into this problem with OH. So here's some examples. 
what I've got here. This is a three delta state. So spin is one, lambda is two, two s plus one is three, and but now what we have are three possibilities here. Omega, omega can be three, two, or one as we change the orientation component of, of, of spin along the axis, which can be either one, zero, or minus one. So what does that mean? That means a three delta state actually has three states. Not enough to tell me three delta, you have to tell me three delta three or three delta two, three delta one. I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to uh, make use of the last slide. So the electronic energy associated with these, these three, uh, I'll call them substates, are, varies by this approximate expression, expression here. So depending upon the combinations of, of lambda and lambda and uh, sigma, here's sigma minus one here, uh, and the value of A, that's the splitting we're gonna see. Now where would I get A? I have to look it up. So typically, if I have a A greater than zero, which is the regular case, the three delta state splits into three states. And the separation is two A. So all I'm really telling you is a three delta state has three substates depending upon the orientations of sigma. And they're, they're labeled three sigma three, or three delta three, three delta two, three delta one. This value here is two A. I don't know what A is yet, it's, it's a number. Might be, might be two wave numbers, it might be 100. It's something you look up. Here's some examples. If you had the beryllium hydride, A is a small number like two. If you have NO, it's about 124. If you have mercury hydride, it's 3,600. Now here's this crazy one. If you have OH, it's minus 140. That just means it's inverted. Okay, it just means it's inverted. The hard part is when you try to put a physical interpretation on A of a negative number. In many cases, um, in the equations we're gonna see for line positions, there's a parameter Y, which is the ratio A over B. B is the usual uh, rotational constant, vibrational level dependent rotational constant. A is this value right here that has this physical meaning right here, splitting between these states. And the values for A can be found in Hertzberg volume one. Now what about the cases where spin is, uh, cases where spin is, un is uh, unequal to zero? That's Hunt's case, we're gonna go to Hunt's case A, that's, there's two cases, Hunt's case A and Hunt's case B. Hunt's case A is, is um, case where we have both of these are non-zero. Sigma has the usual definition of being S all the way down to minus S. And here's our term energy for rotation. That's just the symmetric, uh, symmetric uh, top expression where we have the usual A minus B, but now it's omega squared. Remember in the case of the polyatomic, we had K squared there. So you have always something out here that relates to the moment of inertia about some axis. That was, that was the axis, we had K for the rotational angular momentum about that axis. So these are the log values of omega, of which this is the expression, but they tend to be a small number. J could be anything omega on up. Now, in this expression, in this expression now for Hunt's case A, we have the usual meaning of A and B. Not the spin orbit A that I had on the previous slide course, but that's, that's the way it is. This is the, the moment of inertia based A. So for each value of omega, you have P, Q, and R branches. So if we have a two pi state, which we have for nitric oxide, omega can have two values. Remember, lambda is one, so we can have one plus a half and one minus a half. There's two substates. Those are the so-called electronic substates. Each one is like a new molecule. Each one of those may have three branches, P, Q, and R. So there would be a total of six branches, six branches for the a two pi, three each for the omega three halves and omega one half. Hunt's case B. Hunt's case B is the one where spin, where the uh, lambda is zero. Now the oxygen case. 
there's no more uh, component along this axis. So now we take the vector combination of, uh, of n and s and we get j. In this case, the allowed values of j, uh, in quantum mechanics restricts the combination of the vectors to certain discrete value combinations. J can only take on n plus s all the way down to n minus s with j always greater than or equal to n. Now what's happening here is that s and n are coupling. Whereas previously what we had was s and lambda coupling. So there's no more lambda. In this case, um, if we had a x3 sigma, that three, which I call the multiplicity, is basically reminding me that there are three j's for every n. The way they're handled is there's an f1, an f2, and an f3. And f1 is when j is n plus one. Rather than remember all these, I always just remember this one. F1 means j is n plus one. So two is n and n minus one. So I can remember two and three. So n of two has three values of j. What does that mean? For given angular momentum of the nuclei, n, there are three possible total quantum numbers j. Why? Because of the, can the spin multiplicity. So there are three. That's three up there. It's telling me I'm going to get three of these possibilities. These are just like, they're just different rotational energy levels of this molecule. It's no longer enough to specify the angular momentum of the nuclei. You also have to take into account the spin. So it makes sense, really. But you have to just remember, well, what are these expressions? Well, F1 is, is the J is N plus 1. And then you work your way down. When you go down to N of 0, of course, the only possibility is J of, of uh, J of so these are split rotational levels when n is greater than zero. Each level, each level has a degeneracy of 2j plus 1. Now, what does that mean? Um, each one of these levels uh, has a vector, has the degeneracy of 2j plus 1. What is there? Where does that come from? Remember we had a 2j plus 1 as a rotational degeneracy in uh, early on, and I explained it then. The Energy comes about because if there were a magnetic, a strong field applied, then the uh, J could, would take, could take on two J plus one possible orientations. Even so, but since we don't have a field, we still have to recognize those as states. Those states uh, have this, those states have the same energy, meaning therefore that the degeneracy of this level would be two, two there'd be seven. There are seven states that we have to imagine are here. Oh, let's see. And the minimum value of j is n minus s, and that's why uh, j is greater than zero. Now, so what we have we have to worry about is, in some cases, this lambda doubling problem, meaning that uh, now we're back to the case where there is a value of, of lambda. When there is a value of lambda, it can be either plus or minus, and that corresponds to a splitting of states. So, for a given state, given j, there are two slightly different states. They're usually labeled F sub C and F sub D, where by definition C is the higher one. This can be a very small number. It can also be observable number. When do we have this? Only when you have lambda. If you have lambda, you have to recognize lambda can be pointed either way. That corresponds to slightly different energies. Sometimes people use E and F, but C and D is the most common. Okay, we're gonna see this. I've, been, I've actually shown you a lot of stuff that you often don't need, but you will need it when we do with the, in the next hour we deal with OH. One more complication. There's something called parity. Every state, every state has plus or minus parity given to us from quantum mechanics. And the reason it counts is that you could, we can only have transitions in which the parity changes. Another thing we just accept from quantum mechanics. There's something called parity, and, and it's all about symmetry, and you can only have transitions, allowed transitions between states. You'll see this as we go through the example. All right. So that's a dense topic of electronic uh, contributions to the angular momentum, and the, all of this really has to do with the rotational states. See how much trouble we go to to get the rotational states. Vibrations are easy. 
Electronic states are easy. It's all about the rotational states. Where are we headed? We'd like to use Beer's law and interpret K. If we had a two-level system, that is just two, two, levels, uh, two levels that we're concerned about for an absorption. Absorption coefficient is the line strength times the line shape function. If we use the oscillator strength form, this is the equation here. Line shape, all of this is what we need to do to characterize this uh, S and then it's K. If you look at this, it's not as bad. I mean, remember, this is constants. This is just the number density of absorbers in the absorbing state. This is just the oscillator strength. So there's line positions and there's line strengths. We're talking now about line strengths. It's really not that bad. It's just a question of where do we get these things? Let's see. It really boils down to, if you want the number density in that state, it's the Boltzmann fraction times the total number density of that species. So if you know the number density of the species and the Boltzmann fraction, that's the number that goes here. If you make a measurement and you determine this number, you're probably headed for trying to determine the number density of the species and you need the Boltzmann fraction. So there's really only two numbers in here, assuming you know the, the line shape function in T. There's only two numbers here. Oh, but but so there's, the strength of these things is pretty easy to understand. It's the positions that's so tricky. Okay, so the Boltzmann fraction. Remember now, what we need is the number density of the species in the state that absorbs light, which is the total number density of that species times the Boltzmann fraction. Now we have to be more careful. What do we mean by this state? What do we mean by this state? It's no longer enough to tell me J, remember? I also got to know N, I might ha I have to know more things. What I really want to know is the Boltzmann fraction of the number that are in the electronic state, the vibrational level, values of sigma, um, uh, lambda, j, and n. I mean, that, that's, if you tell me all of those, I know exactly what state I'm talking about. That is really what we have to do. So n's the electronic, vibrational, spin, orbital, et cetera, c or d. There's, in principle, what I want to know is the Boltzmann fraction in the state that absorbs. What's the state? So we talk about energy levels, energy states, a state, is when you have reduced it down to the last remaining degeneracy of 2j plus 1. When you get down to that level, that's the state. Anything above that is some combination of states. And we're going to spend some time on this in the next lecture. Now, frequently, the oscillator strength for a transition between 1 and 2 is written in different ways. It'll, it depends upon the... Um, Rotation, the, the absolute uh, J, V, N. We're really, this is usually meant to be compact notation of a state-to-state of a -state transition. So sometimes it's written this way, even though this is a little sloppy, because within each of these J's is some combination of N's. So this is not, even though this is meant as the state vector, uh, oscillator strength, it, you have to be careful. It's defined in an interesting way. What we want to know is the probability for this transition. Well, what's the probability of an electronic transition times the, times the vibrational transition times the rotational one? And so these are defined in ways so that when you add them all up, it comes out to one. This is the overall system oscillator strength. This related to the A coefficient. This is the fraction, basically, that corresponds to a particular vibrational, prob uh, vibrational probability. This is the uh, honda london factor. Always done, so the sum of these is 2j plus 1. So it comes out to be a 1. When you add them all up, you get 1. OK, there's a lot of complexity here, but it'll simplify in a minute. This is defined so that if you're in a given v double prime, given vibrational level, and you have absorption up to uh, higher level V primes, the sum of all these Qs is one. So if you're in a given vibrational level, you got to go, and you have candidate choices, the sum of those choices is one. It's just a question of which is the dominant one. And if you're in a given J double prime and you want to go up to upper, any possible upper prime J, you get this total. Now, the reason this is so complicated is because this takes into account lambda doubling and spin splitting. So what this, this is saying is that if you're in a given 
J double prime, and you consider all the possible rotational changes, there's four. Well, it'd be four. There's four here. Delta is, is one for sigma of sigma, but it's two for all other, when lambda is uh, not zero, it's two. So there's a two here, and there is, if the spin is a half, there's a two here. So that's just saying that there are four, this is telling, reminding me that for every J over prime, there's four states. Make a little more sense when we do OH in the next hour. But anyway, these terms are all defined so that they sum properly. And uh, it, the notation is compact, and so you have to be careful. In the end, though, the oscillator strengths are tabulated. So, for example, the band oscillator strength for V double prime, V prime, which is the product of the electronic and the Frank Condon, is often tabulated. So, for example, for OH, it's just 0 0.001. It's a number. All that's saying is that the oscillator strength for combining the electronic and the vibrational terms is just a number. The tricky part is always in the rotationals. So now, if I said, well, now I want the oscillator strength for a given transition, well, it would be this number times the quantum London factor divided by 2j double prime plus 1. So when I add them all up, I get 1 again. There's some places where people do slightly some correction terms. We're not going to deal with that. These are really small correction terms. Again, Sometimes people like to use the A value rather than the F, and so this is the relationship you go back and forth. Oh, here's the tricky thing. Sometimes people look at this and say, what's the relationship of the oscillator strength for absorption? What's the difference between F V double prime V prime and F V prime V double prime? The first number is the initial state. The second uh, subscript is the lower, is the Final state. Is that right? This is for uh, when the lower state is written first, that's for absorption, because the first one corresponds to the initial state. F V prime means that the initial state is, is emission. So what's the difference between the oscillator strength for absorption and emission? And this is where it gets tricky. It depends upon the ratio of the degeneracies. Frequently that's one, but not always. And so even though these things are defined so they sum nicely, there's little factors of two and four floating around that can drive you crazy. Okay, that's a lot of stuff that I've given you. Uh, we'll take a break. But what I'm gonna, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to lead you through OH. This is a homework assignment I give the students. They have a week to do this. There's like three lectures on this. It's going fast. But what I'm hoping is that because I put it in writing for you, you can go back and you can attempt to follow it through. And you can see how... Even though there's places where there's factors of two that are a little, which one do I use? You can get to a quantitative number for the absorption coefficient of OH pretty easily. And this is about as hard as it gets. This is about, as, why? Because it's got lambda doubling. It's got everything. It's got lambda, it's, it, because it's a two pi state. So it's got lambda is non zero, spin is non zero, lambda doubling. It's as hard as it gets. So we'll get through that. Then I will reward you by spending in the third hour, we're going to start talking about applications and, and diode lasers and things that are more enjoyable, I think. Okay, see you in 15. <laughs>